Hey everyone, welcome to Oculus Connect. Uh, I'm Paul Yastrzemski uh, from the developer relations team here at Oculus and I just wanted to introduce our uh, next speaker. It's uh, Jesse Shell from Shell Games. Uh, he's going to be talking to you about uh, some lessons that he's learned uh, creating the award-winning game uh, I Expect You to Die. So please give a warm welcome to Jesse Shell. <laughs> <All right. coughs> oh, I should have the clicker. I forgot it. Thank you, Mike. Hey, everybody. Uh, yeah, so I'm Jesse Shell from uh, Shell Games. Uh, we got a team of about 100 people out in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, doing a number of different things, but partly we've been really getting into VR. We have a few different VR titles in development, and one of them is I Expect You to Die. I'm curious, people who played it, make some noise. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Uh, cool. If people haven't played it, we'll be talking about like what it is and, and what we've uh, learned from it. Uh, so I've been into VR for a long time. Here's a picture of somebody uh, doing uh, one of my early VR experiences, like 1993 at Carnegie Mellon. This is back when men were men, women were women, and helmets protected your head. Right? This, this was some serious VR back then. I went from there to Disney, where I became the creative director of the virtual reality studio. And that's not a helmet, this is a helmet, right? <laughs> this is what we were working with uh, back then, a helmet that was so big and heavy, if you didn't have two steel cables uh, in order to kind of help support your head, it would snap your neck. And we used that to create the uh, Aladdin's Magic Carpet Ride, which some people may have seen. It's been at uh, Disney World for the last 17 years at, uh, at Disney Quest, so that was super fun. In the early 2000s, I moved back to Pittsburgh, uh, started teaching at Carnegie Mellon's Entertainment Technology Center with Randy Pausch, and I've done a lot of VR there. I've been teaching the Building Virtual Worlds class there for about the last 13, 14 years. We've had in that time approximately about 1,000 students create about 500 different virtual reality worlds. And so you can imagine like when VR started coming out in the consumer space, I was very excited that it was finally getting ready to happen. And uh, so I'll show you a little bit of a uh, trailer, uh, a, a clip of the trailer shows what some of the gameplay in I Expect You to Die is like. This car has some of the most high-tech weaponry in Dr. Zor's considerable arsenal. Naturally, we'd like to poke at it a bit. This mission will afford you every opportunity to die in peculiar and interesting ways. Say good luck and come out the other side in one piece and all that. But to be perfectly honest, and with all due condolences, I expect you to die. I believe diffusing bombs is covered in basic training, yes? So we had a lot of fun making that um, and, and putting that together, and it's been very exciting how well it's been received. We were at the Proto Awards last night, picked up three different awards, which was just sort of blew our minds because this is this new world where you have an unfinished game on an unreleased platform and it's winning major awards. And we all hope that one day it'll make some money. I, I don't know. I don't know. It's a strange, strange new world that we're all in. So, um, so I got a question. So I know everybody in this room is really into VR. Uh, raise your hand if you have colleagues who are skeptical, right? So, yeah, so I've been super into VR. I, too, have colleagues who are skeptical. So it's not like we're just like, VR is awesome, and Shell Games just jumped in and we did it. Uh, there was a lot of persuading that had to be done. Uh, these are some of the common, uh, common skepticisms, things. Oh, they tried it in the 90s. It didn't work then. It won't work now. It's just going to be a fad, just like 3D TV. Right? Nobody can fix motion sickness. And come on, game consoles are good enough. What do, you, what do you need this for? And you can make arguments about all these things. There's lots of good arguments to try and counter these things. But you know, what we found is that way better than trying to explain to somebody why it's going to work is you've got to show it. So there's a thing we do at Shell Games. There's a picture of our, our studio right there. Once a year, we stop all the projects that we're doing. Everything halts. And for a week, everybody just works on passion projects. We call it Jam Week. And it's a great way we've found to get new things started. And one of our guys um, kind of took, took, and, took it upon himself to like, OK, I want to kind of show people what's going on in VR. So he downloaded as many VR demos as possible, trying to find the best of the best. We started showing them around, started looking. What do we like? What do we not like? Is this a place we want to go? And one that really was a huge influence on us was Blocked In by, uh, by Dan Ernst. Um, this 
is not a game per se. There's nothing really to do in this world. But when I know when I put this on, I had never had such a powerful sense of presence. In the game, you simply sit at a desk and look around a room, and there's a lot of interesting things in the room. And I'd never felt such a strong sense of presence before. And that gave us a lot of inspiration. Like, wow, we, whatever we do in our game, we want this feeling. And we knew it had partly to do with the fact that you were, what your body was doing matched what was happening in the physical world. And there were a lot of really interesting things to look at. So we started building prototypes. And um, some of our early prototypes, we just tried a lot of things. This is a thing called Hexius that we built, which was kind of a puzzle solving game in this kind of spacey environment that involved, you would figure out how to teleport yourself from place to place. We were trying to avoid motion because we're worried about motion sickness. And one of the guys working on it is like, I hate this teleporting thing. I'm just going to make you move around. And we all started getting really sick because, yeah, that's just how it works, right? And this led to a huge argument. Um, because uh, I'm like, come on, man, we'll just make it work. We can do teleporting. You don't need to be moving around to do these things. And other people said, no, this is ridiculous. Because you put the headset on, you want to feel like a superhero. And you're tied to a freaking chair. What kind of superhero gets tied to a chair? And then we're like, that happens all the time. <laughs> that happens all the time, and it's awesome. And it's one of the awesome parts in movies and in TV, and it never happens really in games. So we said, what if we just started there? What if we made a thing where the whole idea is you're immobile, and you've got to figure out how can I manipulate the objects in the room in order to get out of a tricky situation? Escape the room was a genre that we, was kind of well understood, but in a completely different medium. Can we find a way to adapt that and make it work here? OK, so that was sort of how we got started and it was the inspiration for the game. So we've learned a lot while we made it. And I wanted to share some of those lessons. So I'm going to give you six big lessons that we took away. First one is motion sickness can be eliminated. You don't have to live with it. You can make it go away. Let's talk about motion sickness for, for just a second. I know some people know about this. Not everybody fully understands it. OK, so here's how motion sickness works. Everybody has an ear. Some of you have two of them. Um, everybody's ear on each side, you have one of these things, this big purple snaily looking thing, which is this weird thing. This part is busy hearing, and this part is crazy. It's hardware to kind of, it's three rings that are designed to kind of help you balance this little gyroscope in your head. And if we zoom in more, there's this area in here, zooming in over to here, uh, this thing, the Crista Ampullaris. And the Crista Ampullaris is super cool, because what it is is there's fluid going through this ring. There's this sort of waxy, weird thing with hairs underneath it that acts as kind of an analog switch getting pushed back and forth. So it can, detect, um, mo it can detect motion and acceleration. And that's how you don't fall down. That's how you can balance and move around in the world. Now, the problem that starts to happen, um, where motion sickness comes from, is that there are certain things in nature, say Liberty Cap mushrooms, that where if you eat them, you are poisoned and you are maybe going to die. Um, and nature has figured out that you know what, you should really vomit these up um, because they will kill you. And so the way it figures this out is a lot of these neurotoxins end up disrupting your visual system. And when it detects that your visual system and those little hairs inside there are not lining up, it's like, you're poisoned. You're going to die. You should now vomit as soon as possible. Right? The problem with this is there are a lot of things in our modern world that also cause this, being on a boat. Uh, can be one of them. Reading in the back seat of the car uh, can trigger this. And certainly, there are a lot of motion-oriented virtual reality experiences that set off this same alarm system. And it's a pain in the ass of an alarm system, because once it turns on, it really takes a long time to turn it off. Sometimes people use drugs. They take Dramamine to kind of blow out that section of the brain. Unfortunately, there's no such thing as precision bombing. right? And so yes, that part of your brain is off, but also you feel kind of cr weird. Um, I think by the year 2060, we're probably going to have nanotechnology that is going to be able to target this area. and We're going to be able to turn off this alarm system when, selectively when we want to. But until then, we must live with it. We all have the alarm system. We have to live with it. So if you want to avoid motion sickness, here is what you do. Keep your frame rate high. Keep it above 60 hertz at a minimum. 90 is where, probably where you should be. But you want to keep it above 60. But that's hard. Yeah, it's too bad. This isn't for wimps. <laughs> You want to avoid virtual camera motion. And by that, I mean if your head, you're, if you're really moving your head and the camera moves in the world, that's actual camera motion. But if I push a thumbstick and I run down a hallway, that's virtual camera motion. And it's, it is, that is what's going to cause the disruption. You want to avoid that as much as you possibly can. 
If you do have to have motion, virtual camera motion in your world, you want to avoid acceleration and deceleration. The, the balance system in your head cannot detect motion. It can only detect acceleration and deceleration. So if you have like straight up linear motion, it, it, it'll kind of live with it. It's kind of like, I guess that's cool. I guess that's OK. You got to play with that stuff really, really careful. And really important, keep the horizon level. We have special uh, neurons in our brains that are all about detecting the horizon and matching that up with our balance system. The quickest road to puke town is to start spinning the horizon around. You want to avoid that whenever possible. Now, I know some people are saying, but, but I don't want to, I want to move around. I like games where you move around. Isn't a little motion sickness OK? It's just a little. It's OK. We can live with a little. Well, you, like, that's like saying, hey, there's this really great sandwich. It's so good, right? It's so definitely delicious. Um, but, but while you're eating it, you kind of get sick to your stomach. Um, and then for a long time afterwards, you feel that way. But still, it's so good. No, it's not good. That's really bad, right? Uh, when people have, people have scarring, who here, raise your hand if you've had a scarring food experience when you were a child, and now there's now some food for the rest of your life that makes you sick to look at it, right? Yes, absolutely, right? This, and imagine that happens to your game. You're trying to build your game franchise. Someone is now scarred for life, right? Here's my lesson. Don't be a cybermorph. Remember cybermorph? Here, I'm going to show you. Here's an ad from the Atari Jaguar uh, from their pack-in la pack launch title. Check out this advertisement. Here's Benjamin Hall on the Jaguar system to play Cybermorph. Let's see how those beastly graphics and intricate moves that only come from 64 bits of mega power feel. Ben? <laughs> Cybermorph only on Jaguar by Atari. Get bit by Jaguar. What the hell was that? <laughs> No wonder Atari went out of business three months later, right? The, our game is so good it makes you vomit. That, no, that doesn't even make sense. That doesn't make sense, right? You really want to avoid motion sickness. It is, um, is, is definitely something you want to avoid. OK, second lesson related to that, designing for the medium. That is what you want to do. You want to design for the VR medium. It is part of human nature that when a new medium shows up, we imitate the old medium and try and do that in the new medium. It's just what we do. It's stupid, and it always ends up kind of looking stupid. Like early movies, we're like, let's just film stage plays. But then, and of course, that's not a very good movie. That's not good use of the medium. And gradually, people figure out, no, there's way better ways to use this medium. But every time a new medium shows up, people imitate the old one, and then they complain, oh, it's not as good as the old one. Like, I don't have audio in this, and I don't have color. Man, this film will never be as good as theater. But then people figure out how to use it well and how to use it wisely. Gradually, it gets technically better. And film ends up dominating the, the 20th century. Better to skip the early imitation and just jump to the invention. And when it comes to VR, like what is it that's different than where we have come before in video games, one of the places it's really different is the sense of presence. The feeling that you are actually in another place. Not just the idea that you're in another place or that you're pretending you're in another place, but that you get enough feedback and enough signals that something deep in the back of your brain is actually buying into the illusion. And most people who have done some amount of VR have experienced this. Um, it doesn't usually, you don't get it quite as strong when you just look around. You get it much stronger when you can reach into the world because so much of what convinces your brain that the world is real is when you can reach out and touch it and interact with it. You get that powerful sense of presence. And it really is, for people who've experienced it, that you know. You know how powerful that sense of presence is. And focusing on that is really important. Uh, the, some of the things I love is when you have the hand controllers and people are so into the world that they're like, huh, wow. And then they go and they, like, they try, like, hang on, I want to try something. They, they're just they're like, I'm going to put this hand controller down for a second. And they put it on a virtual table. And it goes crashing through the table to the floor. Or they'll go and they'll lean on the table. Oh, oh, that's right. That's not there. That's, that's why they have to put those straps on there. That's why those are there, because you're likely to forget. And this idea of presence is not new. A lot of people are talking about, oh, there's this new thing we've discovered called presence. The MIT's virtual reality journal in continuous publications since 1992 is called presence because people, people in VR understand how powerful this is. And this feeling of presence, this feeling of immersion is 
the most important thing. Um, and this, I think, is one of the biggest changes to get over if you're a traditional game developer. As traditional game developers, you know, we generally believe that gameplay is the most important thing, but I really believe that when you're in VR, immersion and presence, it's much more important. The, the way I think of it is this, the, 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 that sense of presence, that sense that this place is real, is a fragile, beautiful soap bubble. It's tough to get it going, and once it's going, it is just so beautiful and it is so super fragile, and everything in the universe wants to destroy it, right? <laughs> Your job is to keep stuff out of its way, right? And if your gameplay is popping that bubble, what are you doing? Because you're, you'll have moved, because the whole point of doing this stuff in VR is so that you have that sense of presence. If it's gonna be like, hey, well, I've got this gameplay, it kind of ruins the presence, but it's a great game structure, why are you doing it in VR? Go do it somewhere else. If you're gonna do this stuff in VR, you gotta maintain the sense of presence. And what you have to do is remove the things that break presence, the, the immersion breakers. So here's four of the most common immersion breakers. First one, shallow object interactions. Really traditional video game thing is lock and key mechanics. I need a knife to cut something. I need a screwdriver to unscrew something. And in a video game, that's normally how we think. I found, I found, I found the blue key for the blue lock, the red key for the red lock. We found, and so we initially designed I Expect You to Die that way. There was a knife for cutting wires, and there was a screwdriver for unscrewing screws. And we were shocked when people got in here, picked up the knife, and said, let me see if I can unscrew this. They would not do that in a normal video game. That would not be a normal interaction to try. But since everything seems so real, it seems totally natural to try it. And as soon as it doesn't work, it's like, oh, this world is fake, this world is fake, this world is fake, and the immersion is broken. And so one of the things we found is that bit by bit, you have to watch how people try and use objects, and you have to support that usage. Second one is unrealistic audio. We always overlook audio. It's just sort of what we do. Audio is subconscious. We tend to overlook it. Overlooking it in VR is a huge mistake because it's an immersion breaker. If you've got a coin and you drop it on the carpet and it makes one sound and then you bounce it off a cobblestone street and it makes the same sound, your game is saying the, the world is fake, the world is fake, the world is fake. If you have the sound design such that when things interact, it sounds real, um, it's going to maintain and support that immersion. This means, generally, we're finding you have to spend twice as much time on sound design as you normally would. We're finding it is absolutely necessary. Third shortcut to breaking immersion, proprioceptive disconnect. Okay, Proprioception is your body's sense of what position it's in. Am I sitting? Am I standing? Are my arms up? Are my arms down? You have a sense of your bodily position. If I've got an avatar, who is, if this guy, for example, he's lying down here and he's, I don't know, playing Call of Duty or something, and his avatar is running down a hallway, he is having a massive proprioceptive disconnect. And that's telling your body and your brain, the world is fake, the world is fake, the world is fake, because it sees that that's not the case. Anything you can do to line up, uh, to, to avoid proprioceptive disconnect is something that you should do. The, a really quick way, put in a, 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 a virtual avatar in there that doesn't match what my real avatar is doing. You know, I'm sitting in a chair and I look down and I see my legs standing up on the ground. Immediately my body's like, this is fake. This is totally not real. That's why we generally remove avatars because for whatever reason, our brain is willing to tolerate our body not being there. That's less of a disconnect than having the body be uh, wrong. Part of the reason in I Expect You to Die, it's a seated experience. We heard Oculus saying, hey, we, we recommend seated experiences. We're like, all right, we're gonna design a seated experience that doesn't have the proprioceptive disconnect. Okay, and then the fourth one, interfaces that are just generally unnatural. We struggled trying to figure out, like cutting, we understood. I'm holding an, I'm, I'm holding a knife, uh, so I, I should back up a second. The primary interaction in I Expect to Die is with a mouse. Now we were told by everybody, Oculus and everybody, no, 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 we don't recommend mouse and keyboard. I'm like, yeah, I, I don't know how I'd use the keyboard. We're just using the mouse because the mouse is a reaching thing. Reaching into the world enhances presence much better than a gamepad. A gamepad, when you move your thumbs, we found to be more of a, an immersion breaker. Reaching into the world um, enhanced immersion. And one of the discoveries one of our engineers made, Jason Pratt, blew my brain hole open. Um, he said, yeah, I'm doing a thing where you reach in with the mouse and I'm kind of oaring the mouse pointer with where your head is pointing. And I'm like, dude, that makes no sense. Because if I want to reach a thing over there and, the, and my table is here, 
I'm going to like turn my head over here and I'm going to reach out into the world and grab a thing over there. And that's, my brain's going to say, that's stupid. It doesn't work that way. And he said, yeah, try it. And I sat down and tried it. And I was like, oh, holy shit. Like, for whatever reason, the brain thinks this is totally fine. I don't understand this at all. It has something to do with polar coordinates. I'll be damned if I know what it is. But it was shockingly natural. So we got this mouse. We're trying to figure out cutting. I get. I'm going to use the knife. Cut, 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 cut. Like, that feels pretty natural. How am I going to unscrew something? Like, you do this with your hand. I can't do that with the mouse. It's not going to work. So we're like, well, screwing and unscrewing is circular. We'll make a circular motion. And eh, that doesn't work at all. Your body's like, this is some fake bullshit, is what this is. <laughs> So what we ended up doing is you just hold, here, I'll, I'll, just, uh, I'll just show the video here. Um, you, you just hold the screwdriver near the screw, and it just unscrews. I love that moment. It was such a natural moment. He actually dropped the screwdriver by mistake. That is something that would totally happen in the real world. You're reaching over, oops, god damn it, and you reach down and get it. It feels so natural. So the reason that it feels more natural to just hold the screwdriver up and have it do its work is because why the hell else would I be holding the screwdriver there? And most of us have had a lifetime of unscrewing things, and it's become an automatic motion for us. And so automatic motions we don't think about, and so when I don't have to do anything and it just works, our brain doesn't mind it. But you've got to find these things through experimentation. So the most important thing is definitely protecting that soap bubble at all costs. Do anything you can. And there's weird things that protect it. Part of the reason I expect you to die isn't a super serious world, it's a comedy world, is because comedy protects immersion. If I've got a super serious world and something weird happens when an object pops through a table or something, it's just like, pfft, it, reality's broken. In a comedy world, a lot of weird things can happen, and it's tolerable. And so your brain kind of gives you a little more credit. So we, so we went for kind of a comedy world. It was OK that things weren't quite so real, and it helped preserve immersion. <clears throat> and I think a really a big, I mean, we've been, we were shocked. Last two solid months, I Expect You Die has been the top-rated game on, on Oculus Share. And we really feel a big part of it is that protection of immersion. Another important lesson, looking around takes getting used to. It's particularly people new to VR, they don't just start looking around. Here, look at this picture. Look at that. It tells you the whole story right there. We've had a whole life of being conditioned that when you interact with digital media, there, there will be a screen in front of you, and you will sit still, and you will look at it, and you will not move. And that's been our training our whole lives. To get people to break that training, you have to do something active in order to do it. So we did a lot of things. Partly, a puzzle game helps. It's like, I'm trying to solve a puzzle. I can't find anything. No, maybe I should look around. And hey, there's useful things behind you. right? Being in a car, in our case, helps. You know there's a back seat. And you start to wonder, I wonder what's in the back seat. And so you start to look there. We did other things, too. Like you saw that laser eye scanning thing um, that's in there. It's, um, that's a way to get you to move your head. It's one of the first things you encounter. And it scans your eye, and then it says, yeah, no good, move closer. Oh, and so it gets you like, oh, move your head, and then it moves closer. And then it tries to kill you with a laser, and like, oh, god, I better move. And now you actually have to move your head, or you're going to die. Um, another one, silly but simple, looking into things. It's really fun to look into stuff. Ooh, what's in here? What's under here? What's over there? Um, a lot of times, particularly if engineers are making a thing, they want to make a thing really optimal, so you don't have to Move, you move as little as possible. But, but really, it's super fun. Look under stuff, look over stuff, look behind stuff um, is, is something that's really fun. And here's a really counterintuitive thing that we figured out kind of late, but now we're really trying to exploit it. Objects near your head are really interesting and really build immersion. When an object is locked near your head and you're like, Whoa. Now, it only works if you have six degrees of freedom tracking. This will not work so well on the Gear VR, where you only have three degrees of freedom. But when you have six degrees of freedom, use them, because it's like there's something about that that makes the object real. It has to do with the way our brain forms three-dimensional objects by looking around them. And this sort of like makes the objects real in your brain. So we made an interface where, if you want to, you can lock objects in place near your head, partly to be useful. Um, like, I need to disarm this bomb, I'll just lock it in space, and then I'm going to try and disarm it. Um, but also, partly, just to be cool. And a weird side effect, though, was if we just locked it stock still in place, we would repeatedly get people saying, oh, I think the game crashed. I think it crashed. Because they're not used to that, that things being so quite that still. 
And so we were going to get away from it. And we're like, let's try something. We just added a subtle bob. The, the thing's just like bob in the air just a little bit. And people stopped asking that question. Weirdly, objects floating next to your head is like super natural. I don't know why. I don't know why it's natural. It doesn't make any sense to me. Other important things, different hardware enables totally different experiences. If you think you're going to make one game and easily adapt it to all of these platforms, good luck, buddy. You are not going to have a, a very good experience trying to do that. So I really advise people pick one of these platforms and then optimize for it. Um, we were getting a lot of advice that, hey, the thing to do is that you should use game controllers. And we were not too happy with that. We felt it was not immersive. It was kind of an immersion breaker. We started going into the mouse um, because we figured everybody has a mouse. And so we'll start with that because we think it's going to be a way everybody can reach into the world. One of the challenges with this motion sensing stuff, you use the leap motion and systems like the leap motion. They're really cool. They should be super strong with immersion. Except right now, mostly they're kind of flaky. They work well, except when they don't work and your hand kind of flops around or your finger is all twitchy. And immediately, it's an immersion breaker. Um, when the technology is ready, it'll be strong, but it can be a bit of an, an immersion breaker. Um, so one of the things we're really getting into right now, we love, I, I really believe, long term, uh, systems like the touch are going to be the primary way people want to interact with VR because they let you reach in, they let you manipulate, everything feels so real. And, but what we're finding, even in just adapting kind of from the mouse down to the touch, yeah, they're both about reaching in, but it's really different. And you've got to make a lot of decisions and you've got to figure out like what works and what doesn't work. Um, so just be aware that when you would change interface systems, things are going to change radically. And it's, t it's a tough call because we don't know what this market is going to look exactly like a year or two out. All this stuff is getting ready to launch. Are people going to want to play sitting on their desk, sitting on their couch, standing at their desk, walking around a room? We're having more and more systems that, that are letting you have wider and wider spaces you can move around in. And that's really cool and it feels really great. But who has that much space? Who has a 15 foot by 15 foot space in their house? Are we going to see the return of Murphy Bay? beds, right? This will be the hot new gamer thing, gamer beds that fold to the wall so you can do VR in your, maybe, I have no idea. So my last piece of advice, we all know you're making games, you should iterate. Duh. We know this. That's the key to making good games. A lot of people use the 50% rule. All the key features should be in place 50% through your schedule. Spend the rest of the 50% making them good. It's a great rule. With VR, you need to iterate even more because traditional games um, to quote Mike Liu from, uh, from Shell Games, traditional games are about exploring an environment um, and interacting with an environment. VR games are about uh, exploring interactions of objects, about manipulating an environment. You go from exploring an environment to manipulating an environment. When you manipulate an environment, you mix and match things. What will this rock do against this window? What, will, what if I use the knife on the radio? What does that do? And in order to figure those things out, you have to iterate even more. Jason Vandenberg, always a source of good advice. He talks about the 4F uh, method of game design is more true in VR than ever. Fail fast, find the stuff that doesn't work as fast as you can. And when stuff pops up that does work, follow it. Um, one of the weird things we found in early versions of I Expect You to Die was that people loved stacking books. They could reach across the room with the telekinetic ray. They would pick up books and they would start to build them in stacks. What the hell does this have to do with, I'm, there's a bomb, what are you doing? Right? But it was fun and people loved building little stacks. And some people talked about, maybe we should get rid of so many of those books, they're distracting people. We're like, no, people are having fun. Let's encourage that because uh, it's the thing people are having fun with. So I'm about out of time. The last thing I want to say is this is a very, very special time. If you've come to VR because what you want to do is imitate the same goddamn games you've been playing for the last 20 years, just get the hell out of here, <laughs> right? If you're like, VR sucks, no WASD. Like, but if instead, if you are brave, if you are brave enough to jump into the dark water where we don't know what the hell is going on and we don't know what is in there, and you are ready to invent this new medium. If you are brave like that, this is your time. Thanks very much. Thanks, man. Thank you. We got it. There we go. All right. Thanks, Jesse. That was fantastic. Let's give another round of applause. Thanks, Jesse. Okay.